what we're for and how, it will, how it's uh, in stark contrast to what appears to be what the other team is for. And my dad had an expression. So he, someone would come up to my dad and say, let me tell you what I value, Joe. And they say, my dad would say, no, no. Show me your budget. I'll tell you what you value. No, I'm serious. My expression my dad would use, show me your budget. I will tell you what you value. Well, folks, let me tell you what I value with the budget I'm releasing today. I value everyone having an even shot, not just labor, but small business owners, farmers, and so many other people who hold the country together who have been basically invisible for a long time. So at the end of the month, after working like the devil, they just have a little bit more breathing room, as my dad would say. After you pay all your bills, you're sitting at that kitchen table writing out the last bill, do you have just a little bit of breathing room left? <clears throat> so my budget reflects what we can do to lift the burden on hardworking Americans. And there's more than one way to do that. And that would bring us to down to everyday cost. How much do things cost? It's not just whether they're inflation. We brought down inflation seven months in a row. We're going to whip it. But in the meantime, there's other ways to take what is inflation in your budget. I just met, I won't embarrass them by pointing out, I don't, want, I don't have permission, but I just met a woman who has health care costs that are $600,000 a year. $7,000 a month. Well, guess what? How can you possibly deal with that? Well, we just dealt with it, by the way. We just dealt with it. For example, prescription drugs. We pay more for prescription drugs in America than any other advanced nation on Earth. Let me say that again. In the United States of America, for whatever prescription drug you're buying, you're paying more than any other nation on Earth that's an advanced nation. We're finally beginning to change that. I've been fighting that for over 30 years. Because of a law that I worked on and for decades and that I just signed last year, we took Big Pharma on, and we won. For the first time, we won. The other team didn't think that's a good idea. None of them voted for it. They think Big Pharma should be able to make extraordinary profits, exorbitant profits at the expense of the American people. And that's not hyperbole. That's a fact. Medicare finally has the power now to negotiate for lower drug prices. And by the way, you know, they've been able to do that for the, at the VA. At the VA, they're able to say, we're only going to pay X amount of dollars for this particular drug that, in fact, the veterans need. The only place that was exempt was Medicare. They couldn't do it for Medicare, but now they can. And it's going to lower prices for seniors. And, but here's the deal. Not only, for example, the woman I just mentioned, by the beginning of 2025, she'll not have to pay more than $2,000 a year total amount for drugs. <laughs> 2000 The so folks, Folks, it's not just going to save people's lives and save people money so they don't have to go bankrupt to try to stay alive. It's going to save the government. It's going to reduce the deficit. $160 billion. These guys keep saying, how are you going to cut the deficit? Well, guess what? If your tax dollars don't have to go out paying all that exorbitant price for Medicare to drug companies, and it's rational, it's going to save $160 billion in tax dollars. <laughs> Millions of Americans have diabetes. They need insulin literally to stay alive. Woo! How many people know somebody who needs insulin for their diabetes? Raise your hand. Woo! Well, they're paying somewhere between four and $700 a month now were until last month. Well, guess what? That insulin was invented 100 years ago. I mean, one, yeah, literally 100 years ago, okay? You know how much it costs to make that insulin? $10. You know how much it costs to make it and package it? $13.50. And charging the kind of money they charge? Well, guess what? Guess what? Now we've lowered, we've lowered the cost of the insulin to maximum $35 a month. Uh, 
I was at a town meeting in Northern Virginia last year. A woman stood up, and she was, I, I, I was, she was a little embarrassed to speak. She said, I have two daughters with diabetes, and I, I can't afford the insulin. And, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, she talked like that, and she said, and we have to split it sometimes. Can you imagine looking at your son or daughter and knowing you don't have the money to pay for the insulin to keep them alive and healthy? Not a joke. Talk about being deprived of your dignity. Well, got any more. Seniors on Medicare don't have to pay more than 35 bucks a month. And guess what? When not only cut, the, I thought we should cut it for everybody to 35 bucks a month. But the friends, but, but my friends and other team knocked it out. I didn't have the votes. I lost by a couple of votes. Well, guess what? Capping the cost for everybody at $35 a month, especially those 200,000 children with type 1 diabetes. Well, well, here's what happened. Eli Lilly, one of the world's biggest drug companies, just announced it's capping the cost of insulin at 35 bucks a month. Now, how are the rest of these folks going to charge more than that when you can go to Eli Lilly and buy it for 35 bucks a month? So folks, it's going to save a lot of lives, but also it's going to give parents back the dignity that de they've been deprived because they can't take care of their kid for something that's so basic and so important. But again, the MAGA Republicans want to take away the law. They, one of the things they've announced, they want to do away with the Inflation Reduction Act. Okay, well, we have a difference in budget ideas, man. <laughs> More than budget ideas, but anyway. And by the way, how many people, maybe even some of you, you know people who stared at the ceiling last night wondering, God forbid, if I get pancreatic cancer, my wife gets breast cancer, something happens, what's going to happen? How are we going to pay the bills? I can tell the story, and my dad would probably be mad my telling him were he alive. We lived in a three-bedroom split-level home. Nice. I mean, it was a nice home. We were a middle-class family with four kids and a grandpa. And the bed my headboard was against in the room with my, my, myself and my two brothers was against the wall my dad was on. My dad was really restless. He could hear it one night. He could hear the bed. And I asked my mom the next morning, what's wrong with dad? She said, he just, his company said no more health insurance. They weren't going to pay for it. Well, guess what? A lot of people are lying in bed at night wondering what they're going to do. They're going to have to sell the house. What do they have to do if one of them gets really sick? Well, thanks to the American Rescue Plan, which not one single Republican voted for, that I signed in the law as soon as I got to office, millions of Americans, or millions more, have enrolled in the Affordable Care Act, saving an additional $800 a year for better coverage at better prices. My budget's going to make those savings permanent. We passed them up till now, but they'll expire if I don't get them done again. My MAGA Republicans all voted to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. They voted to get rid of it over 50 times since Barack passed it. Over 50 times. Well, it is. I think it is shameful. Folks, no one can deny we have a climate crisis. So we've seen more land, for example. I've been in more helicopter rides these last two years, particularly from Arizona all the way up to Idaho, all the way in the West Coast. More forests have burned to the ground than the entire state of Maryland, the entire size of the state of Maryland. Look what's happening. The Colorado River has become a creek. You have all these environmental problems that are so profound, they're hard to deny. And people are seeing them now, along with extreme superstorms and droughts. That's why I took the most aggressive action ever in all of history in any country to take on the climate crisis by lowering your home energy bills, which MAGA Republicans voted against. We've, got, we've now gotten to the point where it's cheaper to generate electricity from wind and solar than it is from coal and or fossil fuels. And I'm from Scranton. Okay, I'm not against coal per se. A lot of people made a living on that way. 
but we're providing incentives for folks to make the transition. So we're, what, here's what we're doing. We're providing you with a tax credit, a tax credit and rebates if you're buying new efficient, energy efficient appliances. Heat pumps, the new heat pumps, they can heat the whole damn house. No, I'm serious, not a joke. Well, if you need a heater and you need to buy one of those heat pumps, you get a tax credit for doing it. And water heaters, tax credit to weatherize your homes with better windows and doors. I gathered together leaders from American auto workers in the South Lawn of the White House, all American manufacturers. And it was two years, a year and a half, well, two summers ago. And guess what? They all agreed within the next month. They came to me and said, we're going to go all electric. We're going to go all electric. And that's going to save billions of gallons of gasoline burning into the air. It's not only going to save the environment, it's going to help create really good paying jobs. We're providing tax credits for folks who buy electric vehicles to encourage them to do it. We're still going to need combustion engines. We're going to still need oil for the next 10 to 15 years. because all of a sudden, they're not all going to go away. But all this is going to lower energy costs for families on an average of $1,000 a year and create good paying union jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Jimmy, I told you I was going to be the most pro-union president in history. I've kept my promise. I've kept my promise. And by the way, when we're talking about, we're talking about the creating jobs, my buddies at the IBW were the strongest support I had this year. Well, guess what? They're going to install five 100,000 charging stations all across America. And by the way, the things I'm proposing not only lift the burden off of families in America, it's all going to generate economic growth. And that's not all. To support working parents, my budget expands access to affordable child care for millions of families. And it's going to invest in paid family and medical leave, which all of you fought like hell for so that the U.S. is no longer the only major economy in, a, in the world that doesn't have paid leave. Folks, my budget also invests in elder care and home care. How many, how many of you are like, like I went through with my mom and my dad as they got older? They wanted to stay in their own home. It was cheaper to stay in their own home than to have to sell everything and have everything gone to go into a home. Well, fortunately, I lived close enough and they could move in with me. But my point is, it's cheaper if we in fact provide for, provide for the ability for them to stay in their homes. It's not only the right, right thing to do, but it's cheaper on the taxpayer. All the things are gonna help folks go to work, generate economic growth in our nation, and still take care of their families. The point is that when every time I talk about things, people talk about it like this is an overwhelming burden on the taxpayer. It's going to save money for the taxpayers. No, it really does. Save money for the taxpayers. And generate growth. That's how the economy grows. That's why I was able to create 12 million new jobs in two years. More than any president in American history has created in four years. We've done in two years what no president's done in four years because of you. But the point is, it's good for everybody. We're not hurting anyone. My budget also restores the child tax credit. You know, when that was in place during the pandemic, guess what? Child poverty was cut in half to the lowest level in all American history. And guess what? Because moms are able to go to work. Moms are able to go out there and make a living. Folks, we can reduce child poverty and increase child opportunity. Again, it's going to help millions of parents go to work, knowing their children are being taken care of. And yet, only a few of my Republican friends support it. My, you know, my wife, Jill, who's, in, who's a Philly girl. <laughs> if I didn't root like hell for every Philadelphia team, I'd be sleeping alone. <laughs> oh, you think I'm kidding. Jimmy knows my, oh, whoa. Anyway, she's in class today teaching. She has an expression she uses for real. He said, any country that out-educates us 
will outcompete us. Let me say it again. Any country that out-educates us will outcompete us. For decades, we were the not only we were the only country in the world. We led the world economically. We were the only economy in the world that was moving that fast because we had the best educated public in the world. We started before any other country. Other had higher education, was more sophisticated, and a lot of private institutions. But we, everybody in America at the turn of the ninth, the twentieth century, said that we could go to school for free for twelve years. It was a game changer. It was a game changer. But the rest of the world is caught up. We all know twelve years is not enough to succeed in the second half of the twenty, the second quarter of the twenty-first century. Seriously, twelve years is not enough. If we want America to have the best educated workforce, we need to invest in preschool. Not, I'm not, I'm not talking about daycare. I'm talking about school. All the studies have recently shown this is not, this is real. Think about it now. That you know, you learn, you've heard all these stories that if you come from a broken home or where mom or dad has a drug addiction or there's a real problem or you don't have books in the house, etc. By the time a kid gets to first grade, they will have heard a million fewer words spoken. Not different words, just spoken. They're not included. Well, guess what? Studies that children go to preschool who go three, four, five, six years, three, four, five years old, go to school, not daycare, they increase by nearly 50% the likelihood that they'll finish high school. and go on to earn a two- or four-year degree no matter what their background is. Because guess what? Their brain's still developing. They're still developing. They're exposed to the same thing other kids are exposed to. They grow. We also know that many families struggle to afford college for their children. That's why we had these things called, and some of you may have used them, Pell Grants. For families earning less than $60,000 a year, they can get a Pell Grant to go to college, to help them pay for college. For well, the last two years, we've increased Pell Grants by $900, and my budget increases by another $820. It used to be if you went to the University of Pennsylvania, I mean Penn State or the University of Delaware where I went, state schools, the state paid a significant portion of tuition. They're not anymore. They're not paying anymore. They're paying some, but not much, because they've cut paying for it. Well, guess what? Try paying for college, even at a state institution where you can commute. It's expensive as hell, especially if you're a couple of kids in a family making less than 60 grand a year. So it matters a lot. It matters a lot. The more we educate people, the better chance they have. Doesn't mean everybody that's educated is going to succeed, but it's significantly better opportunity. And the world's getting a hell of a lot more complicated. Getting a hell of a lot more complicated. So I've increased my budget. We increase it now, as I said. We're making a, we're we're paying an, another eight hundred and twenty dollars to help people from families. Let's connect students' careers and opportunities starting in high school. We should provide for two years of community college. By the way. In school, when you're in your sophomore, junior, and high school, you should be able to take credits that allow you to qualify for college credit at a state university or at a community college. There, people are beginning to do that around the country. Some of the best training in America has occurs there. Let's offer every American a path to a good career, whether they go to college or not, like the path you started here. The first apprentice program, the apprenticeship program in the nation in which students can graduate as a full-time journeyman with an associate's degree here. In the past two years, we've created, as I said, 12 million jobs, more than two years than any president's done in four years. I don't have to tell the union workers here that includes 800,000 manufacturing jobs in two years. Two years. We've also seen more people start, apply to start small businesses than ever before. Not just unions, it's small businesses. People are now, more people, what's, what's someone making an application to start a small business? It's about hope. It's about hope. 
In the last several decades, corporate America spent — things began to change. I come from the corporate state of the world, Delaware. <laughs> Literally, more corporations are incorporated in the state of Delaware than every other state in the United States combined. It used to be, when I was in high school, when I first got started, those corporations had some greater f social responsibility. They paid higher taxes. They actually saw to it that people — they trained their employees. They don't train them anymore. I met with — when I was vice president, I met with the Secretary of Commerce, and we met with uh, 300 — and don't hold me the exact number — 347, 46 CEOs. And so what do you need most? You know what the overwhelming request was? A better educated public. Well, guess what? Back then, they used to educate their workers. The DuPont company, they'd buy a new industry, they would educate them how to do it. They don't do it anymore. And one of the other things started happening three, four decades ago. American companies started to ship jobs overseas. Why? Cheaper labor. They'd go where they could find the cheapest labor in Asia or Africa, wherever it was. And they'd bring home product made. Well, guess what? We're going to export product and bring jobs home. That's what this is about. I'm not joking. Where is it written? Where is it written that America can't lead the world again in manufacturing? Never underestimate what America can do. We can do anything we set our minds to do. And we know — we know that. We have the world's leading economy. We have the world's best roads, bridges, ports, airports. If we — when we were back in — leading the world. We used to have the best infrastructure on Earth. But the world caught up. You know where we rank in terms of quality infrastructure in the world? Number 13. 13. That's why I signed the bipartisan — this was bipartisan. Republicans joined us. The bipartisan infrastructure law, the most significant instrument and investment to modernize our infrastructure in nearly 70 years since the Eisenhower <laughs> We and you are going to spend — we're going to spend $1.2 trillion over 10 years to rebuild the infrastructure of this country. How can you lead the world if you have second-rate ports, highways, drinking water, et cetera? Instead of Infrastructure Week, which was a, became a punchline with the last guy — remember, every year it's going to be Infrastructure Week? Well, we got Infrastructure Decade. And a modern infrastructure will not only make us more economically competitive, it's going to create more benefits, save money for the country and families. We're going to replace every lead pipe in the United States of America so children can drink water, 400,000 schools, 6 million. We're going to make sure that they're not drinking poison, for real. Every American. That's going to create thousands and thousands of jobs. We're delivering high-speed Internet to every home in America, so no parent has to drive up to the McDonald's parking lot to help do the homework with their kid because they can't get on the Internet. Every single person is going to be able to do that. <laughs> but here's the deal. I've been criticized for this next piece. I probably could cr criticize for a lot before that, too, but for this next piece. The deal is, when we do these projects, we're going to buy American. Now, here's the deal. Back in 1932, we passed a law that's consistent with international trade, that when you, when you give a president money, they, they, when they pass legislation and say, Mr. President, go build a new aircraft carrier deck, they said you should buy American. You should do American products and American workers. Well, no one paid a lot of attention to that. They said, well, if it's 40 percent, it's okay, and so on. Well, guess what? I made sure it's a minimum of 60 percent, and we're going for 100 percent, and we're creating a whole hell of a lot of jobs. And it's, and it's, it's not to hurt any other country. It's not. But think about it. You know, I wonder how many people knew we talked about, quote, the supply chain before the pandemic. 
Everybody knows what supply chain is now. Well, guess what? The reason why we stopped making cars for a while, they became so expensive, we lost the supply chain for computer chips. Because we didn't make it. We invented them in America. We miniaturized them. We made them better. And guess what? They went all overseas. In Southeast Asia, other places. So when they got it, when the pandemic hit them and they had to close down, we had no access to computer chips. You can't make an American automobile without those chips. You can't make a refrigerator without those chips. You can't make a cell phone without those chips and so on. So, the, and I've spoken with our, my European friends, the heads of state, to make it clear to them, we're not trying to deny them anything. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to be at the beginning of the supply chain, not the end of the supply chain. So, folks, so all the construction materials used in federal infrastructure projects can be made in America. Lumber, gas, drywall, glass, fiber optic cables. And on my watch, American roads, bridges, highways, they're going to be made with American products. In addition to that, we need to get back to leading the world in inventing and innovation. You know, we used to support, we used to spend, we used to spend 2% of our entire gross domestic product on innovation and science. We now do 0.7%. I proposed, what I proposed was the thing called the Chips and Science Act to make sure America leads the world in innovation, especially in manufacturing those semiconductors. These are those small computer chips the size of the tip of my little finger that power everyday lives. Cell phones, automobiles, refrigerators, artificial intelligence, so on. America invented these chips. We made them faster, smaller, and more powerful. We used to provide 40% of them to the world. Now, today, we're down to 10%. Today's automobiles need 3,000 of those chips. But American automakers couldn't make enough cars because there weren't enough chips available to them. That's why, remember, the price of cars skyrocketed and they shut down assembly lines? So we did everything from refrigerators to cell phones. We can never let that happen again. Since I've been president, we've already seen companies commit from around the world, from South Korea to in the United States, companies committed $300 billion to build chip factories all across America. $300 billion. From New York to Ohio to Arizona, in Ohio, outside of Columbus, I've referred to it as the field of dreams. Intel came to me and said they wanted to invest. They're going to invest $20 billion. It's already started to build two chip fac fabs, they call them, factories. Well, guess what? It's going to create 12,000 jobs. Excuse me. Yeah, I think it's 12,000 jobs. 7,000 of them are going to be construction jobs. And the rest are going to be jobs working in those factories. You know what's going to happen to those working in those factories? You don't need a college degree to work in those factories. The average salary is going to be $130,000 a year. So, folks, but my budget's about more than chips. It's about science as well. Like I said, we used to do 2% of our gross domestic product. We're doing research to tell the, today. It's now less than, we're getting closer to 1%, but it's less than 1%. We used to rank number one in the world in research and development. You know where we rank now? Number nine, nine. China was number eight a decade ago. Guess what? They're now number two, number two. This new law on my budget will deliver funding to help us lead the world again. My budget also invests in critical issues that matter to families, increasing the supply of affordable housing, lower rental costs, and make it easier to buy a home, all of which will generate economic growth and prosperity. I said to my introducer, he said, I bought a small home and I worked on it. I said, guess what? That's how every middle class family came to be. Why? Because you build equity in that home. And after two years, five years, 10 years, you may have ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars in equity. You can borrow against it to send a kid to school. You can borrow against it to do a lot of things. And so folks look, MAGA Republicans are